In this next section, we are going to focus on uh, the rate at which we can create uh, force uh, with a muscle contraction, and then as well as how um, the uh, initial length of skeletal muscle can affect uh, the strength of contraction. So, so in this, what we're going to do is uh, objectives are to, to be able to illustrate the relationship between uh, force and velocity on a muscle contraction. Um, second, we're, we're going to do the same thing with link tension relationship. Um, and then uh, we'll end up with, we'll uh, end the lesson with um, understanding how resistance training can uh, improve and affect um, these variables. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, if you um, are um, are not uh, familiar with the types of muscle actions, I'll, I'll refer you to page uh, 95 in the textbook. Um, we'll also be covering this a little bit more in the lab and kind of breaking down some, um, I think, a very interesting um, idea of eccentric muscle contractions uh, in one of the labs. Um, but again, we can say that we have, in, in general, three different types of contractions, right? We have a resting link. If we see no change in length of the muscle despite uh, generating force, and this is what's considered an isometric contraction, uh, or in other words, we can kind of write this nice pretty equation that says uh, the force of the muscle is equal to the force of the uh, resistance being applied. Uh, the second is uh, the concentric action. Concentric is uh, caused by a shortening of the muscle. Um, again, cross bridge cycling, uh, that's kind of the goal is to bring the Z-disc together uh, by moving actin over the myosin and shortening the muscle. So in this case, this would be like lifting a weight such that uh, the force of the muscle that we can generate is greater than the amount of resistance um, that it is uh, working against. And last but not least is the eccentric contractions. Eccentric contractions are the lengthening contractions. Um, this is in a situation in which the force being generated by the muscle is less than the uh, amount of resistance being um, being done. Uh, I'll um, mention this really briefly, um, just to make sure you'll probably hear this a couple of times, but uh, when we have eccentric contractions, uh, eccentric contractions are also responsible for what we call delayed onset muscle soreness. Uh, ultimately, these eccentric contractions uh, will cause uh, very small micro tears in the skeletal muscle. These micro tears um, are then going to cause uh, pain, which usually onsets uh, a day or two later. Uh, uh, just an FYI, if you've ever heard it, I'll say this in the lab, and I'll say it in class multiple times just to make sure, because somehow this myth still perpetuates. Lactic acid has no effect on the late onset muscle soreness. The late onset muscle soreness, again, all caused by small tears here um, in these lengthening contractions. Uh, again, we're going to breeze through that. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with these, uh, jump in page 95 in the uh, textbook. Okay, so in um, so the, the next uh, part uh, that we'll cover is the force velocity curve. Uh, in my head, at least, this seems to make a lot of sense. And so what I have here is a blank figure. We'll kind of draw it out. Okay, so as we look at this graph, what we have is here the amount of force that we're generating. This is in the concentric or shortening uh, area, and this is going then in the reverse, again, lengthening, or an eccentric contraction. Our shortening is our concentric contractions. Uh, if we think about this as this uh, x-axis here is the velocity. Uh, velocity is essentially the same thing as speed, so it's how fast we are able to move a weight, uh, for example. So we'll measure force, uh, how much force we can do by how fast we can do that. So first, let's start with, um, let's say uh, you put on the, uh, uh, the easiest example I can use is, is, is a barbell, barbell curl, right? So we put on as much weight um, as we can possibly hold, but it's too heavy to lift, um, but we're able to keep it steady. So that's what we consider, right? What kind of contraction? If you answered isometric in your head, that's correct, right? So your isometric contraction would be the maximal force in which you can um, sorry, the maximal force uh, at which uh, you can generate um, a velocity of zero. This is our max isometric. 
Okay. If we think about this on the other end of things, so think if you are trying to do an arm curl with absolutely zero weight, the amount of force that you will produce is essentially zero, right? The, the slight weight of your arm, um, but since you don't have any uh, weights in your arm, um, and if you think about this, right, we can do this as fast as we possibly can. This is um, all going to be dependent on cross bridge cycling. So we can do that in a very, very fast manner, but the force is heavy, right? And then as we can kind of think about this and fill through, right, as we kind of continue to add weight and continue to lift more, again, this example, the barbell curl, right, the heavier it gets, the harder it becomes to lift this weight until you start to get near your one rep max. And if you think about what's the max amount of weight you can do, I mean, you're lifting it uh, very, very slowly. It does not take very long. So we can kind of fill this gap in again, just by drawing a nice little curve. Again, my uh, computer drawing skills, not the best in the world. So that is the idea of this uh, force velocity curve, right? As the amount of force that you are lifting goes down, the uh, velocity in which you are able to lift it um, continues to go up. So that is covering two of the three contractions, right? So we have our concentric and our isometric exercises where velocity equals zero. This is max velocity. All right. So what about our third type of contraction? Our third type of contraction is an eccentric. Eccentrics are kind of um, special in that uh, we're actually able to generate a lot more force than concentric. And so what actually happens is um, if you've ever done a negative in, uh, in the weight room, uh, a negative is essentially where someone uh, is at the end of their workout, they're lifting, and then they're never fun because usually your, your lifting partner will kind of add weight onto it, and it's your job to kind of hold on to them as long as you possibly can, and the weight will slowly fall. However, you were just lifting this weight um, and were usually at this point fatigued and, and um, we always did them uh, when you are um, actually kind of no longer. So you do the last set to failure and then you do negatives, right? So you're already at your max isometric. So this is a, as much as you can lift and hold it without it falling. And then you add a little bit more. However, the weight just doesn't fall. You're actually able to uh, kind of hold it for a while. And that force is actually... Uh, relatively high, you can get about a 50% greater force production in, uh, uh, in the eccentric contraction phase. And again, uh, the heavier the weight, um, the more force being produced, the faster the uh, lengthening velocity. So the reason that it is believed, at least the prevailing theory, um, is that this is because of all that connective tissue. So in yesterday's module, we um, talked about uh, kind of the, uh, um, the connective tissue that kind of forms all these bundles. Uh, it's kind of stretchy, acts a little bit as a rubber band, and uh, that's uh, kind of here. So this is what we can consider a passive force. It's not the actin and myosin generating any more force, right? Our actin and myosin cross bridge cycling and force generation is maxed out right here. This is what we consider a passive force. So the combination of these um, elastic tissues and our connective tissues that are aiding in the amount of force that we're producing that allow us to produce an even greater amount of force in the eccentric contraction. So here is the same figure. So what this training, uh, so what this force velocity curve uh, ultimately does is it gives us a great window into how to um, effectively train. Uh, so we can think about if we're trying to train for maximal strength, right? We're going to be training uh, on this side of the force velocity curve, right? Trying to work at uh, in between 70 to or 85 to 100 percent of our one rep max. Uh, we can build strength and a little bit of speed here um, in this 75% um, of our one rep max here. Uh, the power, um, the power they suggest here in this figure, a range of about 40 to 60. But uh, most of the literature, um, in my opinion, usually says that power training is usually, yeah, about 40% of your one rep max 
which actually puts it on this side of the velocity. So you actually don't want to be uh, kind of right in the middle, 50-50. Uh, you actually want to be moving faster uh, than uh, uh, the velocity is a more important component of the power than the force ex itself. And if we talk about speed, so if you're doing any speed training, uh, if you're trying to do sprinter work, um, then a lot of that is going to, of course, be working on the velocity aspect and very little uh, resistance. So if we then look at the training effects on the uh, force velocity curve, uh, this is just in the concentric uh, region. Um, but what we'll see here is that um, after training here, uh, one, our one rep max or our maximal isometric is higher, right? So that's kind of the point of uh, resistance training is to get stronger. So uh, after resistance training, uh, I would say this is usually in the uh, 12 to 16 weeks of resistance training, we can see um, a, a nice increase in uh, the force um, generated. Um, and so this is a great example of a uh, strength training paradigm where they really tried to work heavy weights to really improve that. You'll see that their velocity um, uh, may have gotten a little bit slower, but you're not changing a lot of your speed um, speed assets here. Whereas this here, um, so I'll label this for you guys. So this is strength. And this is speed or power training, right? So in theory, what we're doing is we're training on this side of the curve. So you'll see that we may not actually be uh, getting any increases in uh, one rep max or maximal isometric force, but by training specificity, working really here at these high velocities, we can uh, improve the force that we generate at the same velocity. So if we were to draw a line here, you'll see that the force produce, we can produce more force at the same, at any given uh, velocity on about the last half of this curve. So it just gives you an idea of training specificity and um, how that uh, works and working to uh, effectively look at speed and strength training in it. Um, the next relationship that we will look at is the uh, length tension relationship. So uh, the definition uh, is here is the amount of force that can be produced by the muscle depends on the length of these sarcomeres before a muscle contraction um, occurs. So we have an optimal length, it's usually 2 to 2.4 um, microns. And what this says is that the overlap between the myosin and the actin is optimal so that when they contract, we can get a full contraction of the sarcomeres. Uh, we can go either way on the outside of these ranges, so we can uh, then get outside of optimal, which would be in this part of the graph. And here, this is a, a nice graphic illustration here, uh, such that if we get too far, then the overlap between actin and myosin is is not very good and in fact this kind of shows the uh, the very uh, polar end of the spectrum such that there is zero overlap between actin and myosin. So the reason that we uh, really broke down across recycling this is one of the reasons right so in your head you can actually picture right in this we can picture the uh, myosin grabbing the actin acting as kind of this ratchet strap and driving it towards the center, shrinking the Z-disc to cause a muscle contraction. Whereas here in this figure, right, myosin has nothing to grab onto, therefore it can't cause any of this ratchet motion, uh, this cross bridge cycling with power strokes, um, and therefore uh, you're unable to really generate uh, much force at all. And indeed, uh, the exact opposite happens, right? Uh, so if we look at the uh, very, very short end of a sarcomere length, um, then we can see that as actin and myosin bind, no problem, we've got binding sites uh, for the myosin to attach to, but as they try to move, right, there's very little overlap. The Z-disc here is actually bumping up against the, um, the myosin here and uh, uh, realistically this thick filament isn't able to go anywhere and therefore the amount of um, strength generated is very very little. So we can actually demonstrate this pretty well and pretty simply. So you can do this at home. Um, 
uh, we can demonstrate it using kind of a fist, a fist clinch, right? Uh, fist clinch is um, all done by the uh, muscles here in your forearm. So we can start with just a neutral position, right? So we can get a squeeze and we can get a really good um, good forceful grip, right? So this would be in the resting or optimal length. And I'll make um, a comment here. In general, for most of our muscles, uh, the resting position is relatively close to optimal length. We often do not have to do uh, much movement in order to get an optimal um, length. Um, so the second um, part of this is if you flex your wrist and then try to create um, the same contraction. It's much, much weaker. You can't, it's a struggle to kind of get your fingers all the way in and generate near as much strength. So that would be here on the um, too short of a optimal sarcomer length. And of course we can flex our wrist and try to do the same thing. Um, and again, this contraction is much, much weaker, hard to uh, generate near as much force. We don't have this extreme option here where there's, you know, no force can generate it because there's no, no overlap. But realistically, you can see in that easy example that um, the strongest force that you're able to generate is uh, at that resting or optimal length. If you shorten the muscle too much, then uh, sarcomere length gets too close, no movement of actin, um, and then therefore, much less uh, strength produced. Uh, if you uh, um, lengthen them, then uh, the amount of cross bridges that can actually form and be cycled um, are much less and force then is lessened over that. So one other curve that uh, the book has, which I think um, is, a, is a good one. Um, I'll, I'll make one quick comment though. So this is looking at um, force um, generation over time curves. And, and right, this is the idea of, you know, how uh, kind of combining a, a force velocity curve and a strength tension curve to, okay, how fast can you get that uh, force going? Uh, so how powerful are you early on in a movement? And then how well can you maintain that movement as well? So in this figure straight out of the book, this is figure 421 on page 99 here in our orange our untrained person, right? We can increase um, uh, increase strength as we um, begin a contraction. The amount of time that it takes to get to, um, or so the ma the maximum amount of force that we can produce at about 200 microseconds uh, lies about here. If we do heavy strength training, right? Heavy strength training means we aren't specifically really training the um, um, the power aspect of this, that we can uh, see no real change here in how fast we uh, generate power. So the amount of force generated at 200 milliseconds is roughly the same, but because we are stronger, we can increase strength um, more over time. Um, if we then do uh, explosive power training, we can improve how fast we can generate force. So at 200 milliseconds, we are generating much more force than our strength training or our untrained individual. However, we aren't generating huge amount, as much amount of um, uh, gross force because again of the strength training aspect of this. Um, I'll make one comment on this. Um, uh, this goes back to a lot of just kind of strength training principles as we, as we work through this. Um, if, if you as students are interested uh, are doing any strength and power training, uh, one of the keys of, of, um, of power training is that you need some type of um, strength basis. Um, so realistically, what this curve is truly showing is if um, this, if it's a trained person started focusing only on uh, explosive training, or if a trained person then started a heavy strength training protocol. If you took an untrained person and started doing even heavy strength training, they would actually improve power as well. Um, so that's just an important comment for anyone who may be working at personal trainers. Is if you're um, really trying to um, just build power and you're taking someone who has never really lifted weights before, the key is developing an important uh, strength basis, and then you can start the power training um, after that. So that's good for any high school coaches or athletes or personal trainers. Build that strength basis first and then focus on power. Don't try to do power training at the beginning um, because you need that strength 